This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 93. Coming up on Space Time, Europe's envisioned spacecraft designed to surf Venus's atmosphere. NASA fixes a glitch on the Voyager 1 spacecraft, humankind's most distant traveller. And SpaceX sets a new record with more than 3,000 Starlink satellites now in orbit. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The European Space Agency has released details of its upcoming Envision mission to the planet Venus, which is being developed to perform high-resolution radar mapping and atmospheric studies of Earth's so-called sister planet. Envision is designed to help scientists understand the relationship between Venus's geological activity and its thick atmosphere, and it will investigate why Venus and the Earth have taken such different evolutionary paths. Slated for launch in 2031 aboard an Ariane 62 rocket from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, Envision will take three years to reach Venus. Orbital insertion will be at a very high altitude of some 250,000 kilometres. The van-sized spacecraft will then take another two years of aerobraking manoeuvres, dipping down to as low as 130 kilometres in altitude to slow its speed and lower its average orbit through the planet's hot, thick atmosphere, eventually achieving a circular 500-kilometre-high polar orbit for scientific operations. Envision's predecessor spacecraft, Venus Express, performed experimental braking manoeuvres during the final months of its mission back in 2014, in the process gathering valuable data on the technique. Aerobraking was used operationally for the first time in 2017 by ESA's ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter mission in order to lower its orbit around the red planet over an 11-month period. But aerobraking around Venus is going to be a much more challenging affair than what Trace Gas Orbiter experienced around the Red Planet. For a start, Venus's gravity is about 10 times higher than that of Mars. This means velocities about twice as high will be experienced by the spacecraft when passing through the atmosphere, and heat is generated as a cube of velocity. Accordingly, Envision has targeted a lower aerobraking regime, resulting in an aerobraking phase taking twice as long. And of course, Venus is also much closer to the Sun, experiencing around double the solar intensity of the Earth. And the thick white clouds of Venus's atmosphere are reflecting a lot of sunlight straight back out into space, which additionally needs to be taken into account. Then there's the issue of highly erosive atomic oxygen. This is a phenomenon which remained unknown during the first decades of the space age. It was only when early space shuttle flights began returning to Earth from low orbit in the early 1980s that engineers received a shock as the spacecraft's thermal blankets were being severely eroded. The culprit turned out to be highly reactive atomic oxygen. Oxygen normally likes to hang around in molecules. But it forms individual atoms at the fringes of the atmosphere, the result of standard oxygen molecules of the kind you're breathing now being broken apart at high altitude by powerful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Today, all missions orbiting below an altitude of 1,000 kilometres need to be designed to resist atomic oxygen. These include Europe's Earthwatch and Copernicus Sentinel satellites and all hardware built for the International Space Station. Spectral observations by past Venus orbiters of air glow above the planet confirm that atomic oxygen is widespread at the top of the Venusian atmosphere, which is more than 90 times thicker than Earth's surrounding air. To resolve the issue, the Envision team has turned to a unique European facility specifically built by ESA to simulate atomic oxygen in orbit. The Low Earth Orbit Facility, or LEOX, generates atomic oxygen at energy levels that are equivalent to orbital speeds, 28,000 km per hour. Purified molecular oxygen is injected into a vacuum chamber with pulsed laser beams focused on it. That converts the oxygen into a hot plasma whose rapid expansion is channeled along a conical nozzle. It then disassociates, forming a highly energetic beam of atomic oxygen. The facility is also being used to test various solar array materials for ESA's JUICE mission to Europa and Ganymede, which will also have to deal with atomic oxygen issues. However, for Envision, the heightened temperature during aerobraking poses an additional challenge. 
So the facility's been adapted to simulate this more extreme Venusian environment. A range of materials and coatings from different parts of the Envision spacecraft, including multi-layered insulation, antenna parts and Star Tracker elements, are all exposed to the glowing purple Leo X beam. At the same time, they're being heated to mimic the expected thermal flux of up to 350 degrees Celsius. During its aerobraking manoeuvre a decade ago, Venice Express made some remarkable discoveries, which will be followed up by the Envision mission. This report from ESA TV as our closest planetary neighbour, Venus, was formed at the same time and in the same part of the early solar system as the Earth. And Venus was made with the same basic ingredients, the same gases and the same rocks. However, now the two planets are completely different. On Venus, days last longer than years and the planet rotates clockwise with the sun rising in the west and setting in the east. And while here on Earth we benefit from an atmosphere permitting life, Venus is bone dry and cloaked in a thick, choking atmosphere of sulfuric acid and CO2. Since 2005, ESA's Venus Express has been in orbit around Venus, scanning its atmosphere from above. To take a better look, ESA sent Venus Express skimming into the top layer of the atmosphere using a technique known as aerobraking. We went into the atmosphere in this direction because this face of the spacecraft which had been attached to the rocket originally when it was launched, was most able to take the forces and the temperatures. We also turned the solar panels to maximize the amount of friction and to get the most amount of braking. This maneuver offered the first ever close-up view of Venus's upper atmosphere, and it wasn't what was expected. What we saw that was a little unusual is the variability in the pressure, as if there were waves within the atmosphere. And so that possible wave-like structure was not expected. And uh, we'll, analyzing that data will keep scientists busy for a little while yet. Thanks to Venus Express's data, it's thought that these wave-like fluctuations could be related to the speed of the winds that circulate around Venus. And these winds appear to be getting faster. When we arrived at Venus, uh, we detected winds at uh, 300 kilometers per hour, very fast. But what has happened during these years, uh, until now, they have actually increased. We, have, we now see winds of 400 kilometers per hour. And we can't really explain wh why that has happened. Venus Express has spent more than eight years digging into the secrets of the Venusian atmosphere to better understand the complex dynamics between the planet's atmosphere and interplanetary solar winds and the atmosphere and the surface. While these recent findings pose many new questions, it is possible that clues to the answers lie somewhere in the vast amounts of data that have been gathered by the spacecraft over the course of its mission. And in that report from ESA TV, we heard from ESA Venus Express Science Ground Segment Manager Donald Merritt and ESA Venus Express Project Scientist Haken Svedheim. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA fixes a glitch on the Voyager 1 spacecraft, humankind's most distant traveller, and SpaceX sets a new record with more than 3,000 Starlink satellites now in orbit. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA engineers have successfully fixed a crucial item on the Voyager 1 spacecraft which was sending back garbled data about its status. However, the root cause of the problem remains a mystery. Voyager 1 is the most distant spacecraft humans have ever launched. Earlier this year, the probe's Attitude Articulation and Control System, which keeps Voyager 1's antenna pointed towards the Earth, began sending garbled information about its health status and activities to mission controllers. Now, it was all operating normally, and it continued to gather and transmit science data, and the rest of the spacecraft also appeared to be healthy. But still, the issue was concerning. What was causing it, and could it spread to other systems? Mission managers eventually determined that the Attitude Articulation and Control System had started sending the telemetry data through an onboard computer known to have stopped working years earlier. And this computer was corrupting the information. 
Voyager 1 Project Manager Susan Dodd from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says that when they first traced the problem, they opted to try a low-risk solution, simply commanding the system to resume sending data on the correct computer. And it worked. But engineers still don't know why it began routing telemetry onto the incorrect computer in the first place. It's possible it received a faulty command generated by another onboard computer. And if that's the case, it would indicate there's an issue somewhere else on the spacecraft that needs to be looked at. So mission managers will continue searching for the underlying issue, but they don't think it's going to be a long-term problem for the health of Voyager 1. Launched way back in 1977 on a grand tour of the outer solar system, the two Voyager spacecraft 1 and 2 are now flying in different directions through interstellar space, well beyond the heliopause which marks the edge of the solar system. They're the most distant man-made objects in existence. Voyager 1 is now over 23.5 billion kilometres away and heading into the constellation Ophiuchus on the celestial equator while its twin Voyager 2 spacecraft is now over 19.5 billion kilometres from Earth, travelling south into the constellation Parvo. This is space-time. Still to come. SpaceX sets a new record with over 3,000 Starlink satellites now in orbit, and later in the science report, Earth's concentration of greenhouse gases and sea levels hit new record highs. All that and more still to come on Space Time. SpaceX's relentless parade of flights carrying more and more Starlink satellites into orbit is continuing without any apparent end, having now passed the 3,000 mark. Another 46 of the broadband internet satellites were launched aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 4E at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California last week. Following main engine cutoff and stage separation, the first stage returned to Earth, landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. It was the 57th landing of a first stage booster. A few weeks earlier, SpaceX had launched another 52 Starlink satellites from Space Launch Complex 39A on the other side of the country at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Again, the core stage returns safely to Earth, landing on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. As of the middle of last month, SpaceX had placed some 3,055 Starlink satellites into orbit. The company is planning an overall constellation of more than 30,000 satellites, much to the annoyance of astronomers who are seeing trains of Starlink satellites destroying their vital work. And the Starlinks are getting bigger. While the first Starlink satellites were 227 kilograms, the current batch is some 260 kilograms in mass, and the next batch will hit the scales at 295 kilograms. Yet more light pollution for scientists to deal with. Scientists have discovered that alfalfa plants may be the key to growing food on the red planet Mars. A report in the journal PLOS One has found that alfalfa can grow well in volcanic soils that mimic Martian soil, and that the alfalfa could then be turned into fertiliser to help grow turnips, radishes and even lettuce. Talk about sciencing the alfalfa out of it. Scientists have also used marine bacteria to remove salt from briny water, and together they say it shows that it's possible to use the resources on Mars to farm and grow plants and sustain human missions and permanent settlements. This is Space Time. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. 
or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 